This is Parnell Phil. This is strategic marketing at the graduate level for the College of St. Scholastica. This is week one where we'll be covering some core concepts um, of, of the course. Uh, before, we begin, before we begin to get into the, the content, a little bit about the course. This course is designed to, to be specifically, um, uh, uh, specifically focused on strate the strategic elements of marketing and how to, how to market strategically rather than just promotionally or any other kind of marketing. Uh, because a lot of marketing gets done not at the strategic level. A lot of business gets done not at the st strategic level. Um, the word st strategy is way overused today, as you know, I'm sure you all know. Um, and there can be really good ideas and really successful businesses that aren't really operating strategically. And there can be a lot of, and, but, but still be doing fine. And there can also be, so, so not every good idea is a strategic idea. And also not every good idea is a, is a strategic one and not every strategic one is a good one. So we're going to kind of try to get to the bottom of that. And so strategy, the word, comes from a Greek word called strategem. And it actually referred to a building which the Greeks would gather their military and political leaders in. And uh, they would discuss what their... Um, what their strengths and weaknesses were at the given time uh, militarily and, and, and in their treasury, etc. And the idea would be to match their strengths at the, any given time, because of course they change just like in businesses today, your strengths change over time. To match your, their strengths against whoever their, their enemy was at the time, whatever their, those, the enemy's weaknesses are. So it doesn't make any sense to go, if, if you're if you're really great at having a navy, if your army, if your military has a really great navy, it makes much better sense to use that navy to prosecute a weakness in your enemy. And if your enemy is, also has a really great navy, having your great navy fight their really great navy is not a strategic move. It'd be much more strategic if they had a really weak, I don't know, if they had a really weak navy, then it would be smart to go after their weakness. Um, and businesses do the same thing. So the idea here is to try to figure out what it is that you have that your competitors don't have that you can exploit. Okay, so at the root of this course is this question, which of these two paper coffee cups is more valuable to you? Which one of these cups, presumably exactly the same in every functional way, which one is more valuable? It's not a trick question. And we, since in this, in our consumer um, oriented uh, culture and in our, since we happen to be a capitalistic society, we sort of think about this kind of stuff intuitively and it's almost subconscious to us. But we, you and I both, make determinations every day about exactly this sort of thing. Which one of these is more valuable? The marketer's job is to not only ask that question of their, of their consumer, but also to sort of intuit what their answer would be and then act accordingly. So, the value of the, one of these cups has nothing, well, has something to do with how much the cup costs. It has something to do with how good functionally it is compared to the other one. It has something to do with how badly you need it or want it. So all of those things go into a, in, in, come into play, um, for, and, and all of us weigh each of these different factors differently depending on our individual preferences. That's why it's a, it's, it's a hard game. It's a, it's a hell of a hard game, and that's why not everybody does it perfectly well. So let me ask again, let's pretend, let's pretend that of these cups, presumably they're, they're, they're the same functionally speaking. Let's say this one has a price tag of 10 cents. This one has a price tag of $1. Ten cents, one dollar. Which one of these is more valuable? If you're saying the one with the dollar price tag is more valuable, then that would be incorrect. Probably. Let me go on. Most of us, I'm, I won't be presumptuous, but allow me to presume, let me be presumptuous, let me presume that 
nobody listening to this conversation right now is a paper cup aficionado or expert. And so for most people, these paper cups doesn't really matter which one I use. In that case, the one that is going to cost me only a dime versus a dollar, this one's more valuable to me. Now, if I was willing to spend the dollar to buy this one over this one, well then, for the person selling the cup, this one would be more valuable. And for the person buying, he would have expressed that value by buying that cup. So all of us, regarding paper cups or regarding pickup trucks or regarding whatever thing you want, might want to buy and consume, we make little judgments like that. So this one's a dime again, this one's a dollar. Now let's pretend this cup, the dime cup is gone, it's in Zimbabwe. Which one is more valuable to you now? The dime cup in Zimbabwe or the dollar cup here? Most people would say that the cup that's right here in front of me is more valuable because it's easier for me to get. I don't want to travel to Zimbabwe to get my paper cup. So that's sort of a, an example of the dynamic nature of value. It changes depending on the circumstance. Now for some people um, in the paper cup consumerate class, they might be so incredibly passionate about a given thing. Let's say the cup that's in Zimbabwe right now was once used by Jimi Hendrix, and this person loves Jimi Hendrix so much that they're willing to go to Zimbabwe to get that cup, well then that cup's more valuable to them. Or maybe the person that's consuming, used a paper, the paper cup consumer is super passionate about the fact that that paper cup was made of some exotic paper, you know, that saved a million koala bears or something, I don't know. Or maybe that cup was is certified to not have been produced with child labor, or something or maybe it's made with all organic material, whatever. So the point is, just because these two cups have the same functional utility, that is what these cups are designed to do, they can have, much, they can have widely differing value based on their non-product value, which I will get into in a little bit. So as I mentioned, that's the, that's the determination of value. The thing to remember and the thing to etch on your brain is, that the, determin, uh, determinate, the determination of value belongs to the consumer, not the marketeer, not the producer of the good, not a government. Nobody but the consumer gets to decide what the consumer values most. It's just sort of a human nature thing. That's not entirely, we, we think that's, we come by that um, notion of fairly instinctively because we've been living in it for, well, since the country was born. Um, but it's not the only model, it's not the only, um, it's not the only way to have an economic system. Um, for instance, we know that socialism, communism, um, the consumer doesn't get to determine value, or at least the system work, it, it's set up so that the consumer doesn't determine value. The producer, the government, decides what the value is and so thusly puts a price on it. <laughs> um, we also know from experience that that system doesn't work very well. And in my humble opinion, it's because we humans are just sort of naturally self-interested. And we are, I want to determine, I, get to, I want to determine what I'm going to spend my money on. And I want to determine which one of these I think is more valuable for whatever the hell reason I want. And since I have that power, I have, I have a, since I have that power, I have a lot of leverage in, in the financial, um, in, in the economic, uh, uh, formula. And so marketeers on the, on the supply side of this equation have to be deeply tuned into that. So that's how value is determined. Value is expressed, on the other hand, by how much money you're willing to pay. I express my value by taking out my wallet, giving you money, and then you give me the good of the service. That's my expression of value. Because I can determine the value, but me not, me, me not being able to express that value doesn't do any good for the marketeer. So I can determine that that Lamborghini over there is very, very valuable, but I can't express the value because I can't buy it on enough money. So for the Lamborghini marketing guy, he's wasting his time on me. 
you understand my point there? So determination and um, expression of value are, are, are differing things. Uh, let's see. Next slide. I'll just, I'll just go on. Um, one of the things that I, that, I, that I mentioned in my last little spiel there, a couple of the words, one was functional utility. One was functional utility. The other is non-product value. Non-product value. So non-functional utility is literally what this cup does, what it's designed to do. This one has the same functional utility as this one, which has the same functional utility of your coffee cup you're holding in your hand right now, which has the same functional utility as the, the wine glass that you are maybe drinking out right now, whatever. They all have the same functional utility. Now you might argue that the, the wine glass has a different functional utility because it's meant to hold wine and this is meant to hold a, you know, a coffee or a hot beverage or something like that. You can make that argument and you would if you were trying to market the wine glass versus this, etc. But in total, in, as a, generally speaking, it's in the same class of products. Non-product value is everything that adds value to the product or service that has nothing to do with its functional utility. So the fact that it has these little, cut, little finger holder here, or the fact that it's got this design on it, or the fact that your pickup truck has a gun rack in the back, or the fact that your minivan has cup holders and a, you know, is the color red or what? Those are all functions of non-product value. Now, non-product value and functional utility, functional utility are both very marketable and um, and both 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 very leverageable. But in generally, but generally speaking, they become more or less comparatively leverageable depending on where we are on the um, market life cycle. So let me just draw that to. Okay, so this is the nascent side of the market life cycle, and this is the mature side. Um, so beginning and and not mark. Sorry, functional utility is generally more leverageable at the toward that end of the cycle. And that is because by definition in a market, if, if your product um, has better functional utility than competitive products, it means that there's not a lot of competitive products with the same functional, functional utility. Think iPods in the, I don't know, 15 years ago, whenever it was, the iPods came out. When that came out, its functional utility was different than whatever it replaced, namely compact discs. Um, and compact discs had different function, had a, and well, not only did that have more functional utility compared to compact discs musically, um, literally by for playing music, but it also allowed people to store their whole music collection on a device that's big, etc. So on a lot of different fronts, that iPod was a, was a home run because it was functionally different than everything it competed with. Um, on the other hand, in the equation we have in the mature market, we know it's mature, we know a market is mature when the functional utility of the things in that same market are very similar. For example, Ford trucks versus Chevy trucks. And some people place a lot of non-product value on either Ford or Chevy because they like one brand better than the other brand, and etc. Or they like the Hemi versus uh, whatever the Triton V, whatever the hell it is. They, 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 they like one or the other for some reason, maybe because their dad had one and their first truck they ever got was a Ford or whatever it was. For some reason, those are non-product value issues. And so when functional utility kind of gets used up or drained or sapped, etc., then we start practicing, we, we start to leverage non-product value. That's on this side of the equation. And most of us in our marketing lives, most of us in our business lives will end up focusing on mostly that stuff because most of us live in worlds where there is competition for the stuff that we sell. So if you work at a, if, you're, if you 
work for a hospital, there's lots of doctors in the world, there's lots of hospitals in the world. If you work for a massage therapist, there's lots of massage therapists out there. If you work for a car fixing place, there's lots of those out there too, etc., etc., etc. If you find yourself in a position in life where you really are something that really is quite different and novel, you know, put your seatbelt on and get ready for a nice, fast ride because competition does happen inevitably. Okay, next core concept. <clears throat> so, one of the things that I want to make sure that we start off with is a common definition of what we mean, common definition of what we mean by marketing. Um, there are lots of them. And look at a textbook, um, any textbook will say something. Most textbooks, marketing one-on-one -on -one textbooks, will give a definition to something like this, something about the, the vortex of where the right product and the right price meets the right consumer at the right time at the greatest convenience or something like that. And that's all true and that's all, that's, that's fine. But um, the, the, the definition I like to use, um, in my opinion, helps us to focus our attention um, not so heavily on the delivery of the marketing but on the strategic nature or the strategic composition of what will become a marketing plan. So, think of it this way. There is the supply side of the equation, and there's the demand side of the equation. And um, we, as marketeers, marketing people, obviously are on this side of the equation. We're on the, we're on the supply side of the equation. We're trying to, we, we want the teeter-totter to be heavily on the demand side. We want there to be more demand than there is supply, right? That makes sense. So, marketing then is this fulcrum. Marketing is, the definition is, marketing is the fulcrum on which supply and demand are balanced. And that is not to imply that supply and demand are, are always balanced, or in fact it's very, very rare. It does happen. It's called a perf it's called perfect mar a perfect market, and it does happen, but it's it's rare and it's it's quite fleeting. Um, it almost n it well I shouldn't say this well it almost never happens uh, naturally. When it does happen, often it's because governments or some somebody else is putting steps into place to even stuff out because they don't want because uh, supply and demand uh, market market based economics can be freaking brutal and there are winners and there are losers and you know we don't like we don't like that we like everybody to go home happy so inside this fulcrum there are if you've had marketing 101 you know what the four p's are which are <clears throat> product product development stuff price um, Distribution or placement, if you want to stick with the four P's, and um, promotion. So, one of my pet peeves in life is when people consider marketing with a capital M to be merely promotion. Those things are not, these two words are not synonymous. Not synonymous. Promotion is a super important piece of the pie, no question about it. But without the rest of the stuff, you simply can't have a strategic plan. It's like saying, I don't know, your steering wheel is super important too, but if you have a steering wheel but no drivetrain and no tires and no engine and all that stuff, then your car probably isn't very, very healthy. It's the same, same idea here. And these things all have to work in concert. Okay, so the next piece here, and those of you who have had me as students in the past, this is a review, I know. Um, so I apologize for that. But we have to start on the same, we all have to start on the same page here, so I gotta get through this. Uh, so my point here from the last slide that I, that I showed you on the board here is about aligning all of these elements. 
So one of the big exercises that, that kind of at the root of this course is going to be called the something called the strategic alignment model. The strategic alignment model. And this is a model that you'll be able to use for the rest of your life and it's hard. It's very difficult because it's this all this marketing stuff is, is very difficult because the target is constantly moving. The um, competitive environment is always changing. Uh, but it's just like anything else. The more you do it, the better you'll get at it. So I want to get you going early on in the course. So we'll be starting that next week. Um, and you shouldn't, you will be frustrate, frustrated by it. I, I can almost guarantee you that. Um, but the more you do it, I can say the better you'll be. It's just like doing push-ups or, you know, doing anything else. You get stronger at it, the more time, the more you flex your muscles, the stronger you'll get. <clears throat> So let me make one more point here before I conclude for this particular thing. Um, in, in light of this alignment model, one of the key features is something that's called the core competency. So the core competency, that's another word that gets overused and abused a lot, and that's too bad. Um, a core competency isn't necessarily just what you're good at or what you're best at. A core competency, to be a true core competency, rather than just an operational competency or something that you're something you're good at, it has to have three um, components to it. So the first thing that it has to do in order for it to be a core competency has to give you a competitive advantage. to give you a competitive advantage. So if you're good at something, I don't know, unicycling, but you happen to be uh, the wide receiver for the Minnesota Vikings, then your unicycling skills don't necessarily give you a competitive advantage. It's really cool that you're good at unicycling, but it's just that it's not helpful. It doesn't give you a competitive advantage. So to use a business example, if you're really great at making widgets, but everybody else is really good at making widgets too, and it doesn't give you, doesn't give you a, a competitive advantage. A lot of organizations fall into that trap, they become myopic because they're very proud of what they do. Maybe they've been making widgets for a hundred years, maybe it's a family business and your grandpa made the first widget ever made in the history of the world. And so you're very proud of that heritage and all that stuff, but nowadays everybody's caught up with you and to, as, a, as, a, as an objective truth, a lot of people make widgets and some are even cheaper and some are even better than yours. So that's the point. It's got to give you a competitive advantage and we have to be honest with ourselves about that. Second thing is it has to be able to make you money. If you have a competitive advantage but you still can't make any money at it, if the economics don't work, then what the hell's the difference? So again, these are, these are things that have to, be, have to be looked at quite clearly. And this one's pretty objective. You're any good controller or, or bookkeeper even can figure that out. Are you making money on this thing or not? Thirdly, not easily duplicated. In order for it to be a core competency, it can't be easily copied. Because if it can be easily copied, that's exactly what the hell is going to happen. It's going to happen anyway. But the easier it is, the, 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 weaker your comp, the weaker your core competency is. Now, it, it is altogether true. And if so, you might be, you should, ask yourself this question of your own company that you're, that you're presently engaged in. Um, do you even have a core competency? Many organizations don't. That doesn't mean they go out of business immediately. You, you don't just dry up and, and, and die. It just means that you're competitively at a disadvantage because you don't, this thing isn't in place. And if you don't have a core competency, one thing you can do is go get one. You can buy one. If your core competency is your R&D personnel, well then you can go hire them. Steal them from your competitor, whatever. Um, educate them. If, you have, if maybe your core competency, you can buy a piece of property and maybe that'll be your 
core compass that your competitors can't copy because you're you have the best you have the best corner in town to sell your widgets on or whatever. So the point here is that an honest look at your organization's core competency might allow you to say, God, we really don't even have one. So we better get one. If we want to be in a better competitive position, we will go out and we will acquire a core competency or we will build one. Uh, let's see, so that's it for lesson one. Um, and we'll see you next time.